Hi, everyone. Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America. This is Code Pink's weekly webinar, 20 minutes of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. We come to you live via Zoom and Facebook every Wednesday, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern. And today I'm very uh, pleased uh, to welcome for all of you to hear directly from and share comments, questions with Carlos Ron, Venezuelan Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs representing North America. Car and Carlos has worked in North America for many, many years, um, is now working out of um, Caracas and is coming to us live from Caracas this afternoon. So we are really happy that he has been able to make time for us despite all of the uh, news and projects on your hands <laughs> and so much of it coming um, directly from the United States. So this morning and afternoon Eastern time, um, we're gonna give Carlos 20 minutes to talk about the um, US aggression towards Venezuela and, uh, and US Venezuelan foreign policy in general, but specifically uh, the maximum pressure campaign that has been overtly uh, discussed in the media from the White House and the State Department, and very clearly yesterday at a public event with um, Elliot Abrams, the uh, U.S. Special Envoy to Venezuela. So welcome, Carlos, and thank you so much for giving us this time today, and we're really pleased um, to hear from a representative of the elected Venezuelan government. And um, why don't you start by telling us what the maximum pressure campaign is and, um, and then let's go from there. Thank you, Terry. Well, it's a pleasure uh, for me to, to be here and to be able to join your audience. Um, and also, well, let me start by thanking you uh, and all of Code Pink um, for uh, the support and solidarity that you have with and it's all, not only towards Venezuela, but towards the rest of Latin America. Um, yesterday was a, a, you had a very excited crowd in, in Caracas enjoying uh, what, what took place uh, and, you know, having somebody actually stand up and say to Abrams and, and to the people that were in that room that, you know, what they're doing against Venezuela is really a crime against humanity. And, and that's what uh, we believe these so-called sanctions are. Um, so what, we were talking about the, the new or, or a new step in, in this uh, campaign against Venezuela, which a couple days ago, there was a, on the 7th, there was a, a phone call, um, you know, those press calls that they give uh, to uh, press briefings, uh, uh, high, uh, high government officials yeah. uh, give, but you never know who the, who the government official is, you know, they, they blank out the name. That very and, nebulous term. <laughs> Yes, no, it's funny because it, it's hard. It's hard for me to explain here, you know, because everyone's like, "Well, who said that?" I was like, "Well, oh, some high government said, but who is? And no, nobody knows who it is because they they hide them, um, because you know we think they're so ashamed of what they're saying that they'd rather not show their faces." <laughs> but in any case, uh, this so-called uh, high uh, government official uh, started speaking about the, you know, how they're stepping up their campaign against Venezuela against the, uh, like you said, the legitimate uh, government of President Maduro. And, and they're saying, they're calling this the maximum pressure. They're saying that uh, until now, they have only exerted about 50% of the pressure that they could exert, but that they what, could- What uh, is that 50%? So well, that our listeners what, understand more clearly. Well, apparently what they mean by this is that, you know, the, the um, economic, financial blockade that, uh, you know, the so-called sanctions that they're uh, doing against Venezuela. We say so-called sanctions because like, you know, remind our listeners, these are unilateral coercive measures. They're not real sanctions because there's no authority by the United States to sanction anyone. Sanctions, real sanctions, according to international law, can only take place uh, once the Security Council has met and has decided that there's a, a, a country that, that needs to be somehow uh, held accountable for something, and that's when these are implemented. Uh, otherwise, these are illegal measures taken by, you know, like one country. So far, and, and you know, there's many reports, there's that CEPR report that talks about uh, at least 40,000 deaths. We have uh, Alfredo Salles, who's a uh, repertoire on human rights in, in uh, we should say, even calculate even more deaths uh, uh, to, to 
the effect of these illegal measures. At the end of the day, we're talking about blockade that uh, does not let us make uh, you know timely purchases of medicine, timely purchases of uh, food, uh, essential goods that we need for consumption, production, and all these things. Um, and and also, you know, uh, other measures that are blocking, uh, you know, everyday life uh, for most Venezuelans. I mean, one of the recent ones, for example, was an attack on our uh, signature airline, uh, which is state government uh, or state-owned uh, airline called uh, Conviasa. And you know, the workers from Conviasa now face, you know, problems because you know these this, these uh, uh, measures are now uh, blocking the Conviasa's ability to travel and to refuel and to some of the basic uh, things an airline needs to do. This affects not President Maduro, it doesn't affect me, it affects you know, the whole population, that, you know, the workers of the airline, the, the people that, that use the, these airlines to, to uh, travel. You know, one of the issues that has been going on recently in, in Latin America, and you almost know this, is that there was a, a hike in xenophobia against Venezuelan migrants into many of these countries uh, throughout the region, Peru, uh, Ecuador, we saw violent cases, people chasing Venezuelans down the streets. And we decided as a government that, you know, there are some of our uh, people that, that left the country, um, you know, seeking, like, like other immigrants do, seeking a, a, better, a better economic alternative. And when they uh, arrived in these uh, other countries in Latin America, they, they felt, you know, that, that they had been tricked. That it wasn't what they they were expecting, and now they were facing these type of uh, racist aggressions. So we implemented a program where these people were would be able to come back to Venezuela. We we had a we chartered the plane, and they would come back to the country, and and, and you know be able to to come home and, and and try to you know work things out here. Now this program is also going to be affect, affected by these economic sanctions on Conviasa, which is the airline that carried out uh, these travels. So in a general sense, you know. They already are inflicting a strong amount of pain into the, you know, into the people's lives here. This is not an attack on the government. This is an attack on the whole population. This is this is what in in international law is is, seen, is known as collective punishment. You cannot, you know, cannot punish a whole group of people, a whole nation of people, just because you want to promote regime change or you know change of government that is favorable to your policies. And this is what the violation, the violation is. Now, they're saying that this is only 50%. We've only seen 50% right now. So now they're going to some other extreme. And what our concern is, is that while they say this, they are involving our neighboring countries. They're involving Colombia. They're involving Brazil. In less than two weeks, both presidents have, uh, of those countries have gone to meet with Donald Trump. Then they have also gone to meet with the Southern Command. And, you know, we, we know that uh, we've seen this in, in other cases throughout history, how they, there's always the, the staging of a false flag operation in order to generate, uh, to justify international operation. They even recovered a mechanism called the Rio Treaty, which is something that was designed in the Cold War as a sort of uh, South American version of NATO. And that was never, it was never productive, it was never activated. And now these countries, uh, you know, the United States followed by Canada and, and by other uh, right-wing governments in, in the region are trying to activate this, uh, this uh, treaty in order to justify intervention in Venezuela that could be a military intervention. This is something that we're scared of because I mean, even Trump in 2017 said himself, we haven't ruled out uh, the other, we have all options of, on the table, including the military option. So we have been threatened, even though we're called the, you know, the, the, the threat of the neutral the national threat. security threat, right? Yeah, but the, we're the only ones that have actually, you know, President Maduro has never threatened Trump with an invasion, but, you know, we have been threatened with a military action. So it is, it is definitely concern, and, you know, a lot of concern, because when you see what's going on inside of Venezuela during the last few months, um, you know, they tried to prop up this, uh, this regime of... of uh, Juan Guaido as a, they call him interim president. You know, this is a person that has never been elected to any, any position near uh, the presidency. Um, he, he is then, has been uh, using this so-called uh, interim presidency 
through all these uh, months to gain tax U.S. taxpayers' money because you know they're either gaining uh, millions and millions of dollars from USAID from uh, other uh, things that they, they they put on the on the budget, um, and and then even there's questions as, as to what's going on with this money if it disappeared if it was stolen. In any case, they have they really don't have any any true support in the Venezuelan streets. They had a they, even yesterday a demonstration. You saw that it was some people, yes, because there are people in the opposition. That's that is true, but they don't have the support of all of the opposition. There's actually a very important part of the opposition that is sitting down now with the government, trying to work the com the composition of a new electoral council. Because this year, according to our constitution, we need to have new elections for the National Assembly. So when you see is, is this small group of opposition leaders who are in key, you know, right in tune in with Trump, and they're there trying to be, you know, to, to not allow elections to take place. They're, they're blocking you know, the approval of a new electoral council. They're blocking uh, diplomacy with the United States. I mean, the, the, we could have always solved this through diplomacy, sitting down, figuring things out. You know, we don't have to agree on everything, but we could have a relationship uh, with respect if, if, if that was the case. Um, but it's a small group of, of opposition leaders who are trying to maintain uh, this disruption, and the U.S. is backing them because they're they're going to pro they're, they're wanting to promote the the uh, policies uh, that the United States uh, seeks in their interest. Um, I wonder if I can ask you something mm -hmm. at this point about that internal dialogue, because that is something that is heard very, very little of here in the States, that there actually is dialogue between the government and um, I guess I would use the word the more reasonable opposition uh, <laughs> people who want to find a Venezuelan solution for Venezuela. We hear very little about that. And um, presumably because that's not the solution the United States wants, the United States wants its own solution. But in regard to making progress in those conversations, is there a connection between that progress and um, the burning of the voting machines the other, other day? I mean, it seems to me that if there's some progress yeah. being made, and now it's been, now there's this attempt to sabotage the ability to actually hold elections with the technology, so with the that technology is, being destroyed. Mm -hmm. Well, that is exactly part of the concern. And, that, and, and that's why none of these things are going on in recent days are, you know, can be a, just a coincidence. That's why we're concerned about this maximum pressure and what they mean by upping it, you know, the, the next 50 percent. Because when we saw when we saw that White Dawes popularity is waning in the Venezuelan people, and then he took this tour throughout the United States and went to the State of the Union and they tried to, you know, sort of prop him up. You saw that there was an attempt, a deliberate attempt by uh, the, the Trump administration to say, okay, this is our guy. We are only doing what you know. What we tell, we're only agreeing with what he says. We're not going through elections, and we're going to keep our pressure because what we really want is not Venezuela to decide the future. It's Venezuela to kick Maduro out, to kick Chavismo out of the game, and and you know this is uh, this is something that is not acceptable for for you know an independent country. It's something that that is it can be acceptable in a real democracy. You can't impose you know or you can't say from outside that someone can or cannot be president. And now we see, so, so our concern is that you see these military actions, but you see also uh, um, terrorist actions because that's really what it, what it is. I mean, what, what's just when Guaido is trying to, you know, move people again and, you know, and, and, and have like a new campaign and, and to rally his supporters, then, and, and when they're all posting elections, how much of a coincidence is it that you, you see the, these machines are all of a sudden uh, the peer, you know, explosion that burns, you know, uh, thousands of voting machines, which, by the way, we're known as, as you know, a, a, a country that is, uh, whose voting system is, is one of the best in the world. And, you know, you have the well, famous quote by the one we have here in the States when you look at the, the closing of polls and the well, lines we that we're seeing. <laughs> we don't flip coins to decide elections, nor draw cards. I can so. attest to that. I've been to Venezuela on election day more than once. 
Yeah, it's not a coin no. flipping situation. So it, so you know, so we we we're not making accusations directly because we obviously there's got to be an investigation that's on, going on right now. And you know, to inside Lucena from the National Electoral Council gave a press conference, you know, saying what had happened, and that you know that they're also looking into investigations. But we know there's a pattern of, of operations in, in, in Latin America's history. And we know that when, you know, the United States says, you know, they're putting up more pressure for, uh, you know, explicit change of government. We know that all these things, you know, it opens the door for many things, for many interpretations, for many people to get involved, many uh, criminal organizations to get involved, for many actors to get involved. So it's no, it's no coincidence. Again, we're, we, in that that press uh, briefing uh, was very interesting, um, and I invite your your listeners to to go look look it up. I think it's on the, uh, it was on the seventh of, of, of March, the press briefing on Venezuela, and and it was interesting. The Monroe because, Doctrine two point press conference. Yes, I think, but that exactly, one, right? yes. exactly. <laughs> Monroe Doctrine two point <laughs> oh. Nope, we lost the briefing. I guess. Yeah, well, I guess I guess Kerry never told the uh, Trump that the, he had canceled the Monroe Doctrine when he was there because I remember <laughs> I remember quite clearly, you know, Kerry canceling the doctrine, and now apparently it's, it came back, and now it's this 2.0 version. But the the interesting thing is that they say, uh, why is it why is this a Monroe Doctrine again? Because they want to make this hemisphere the first free hemisphere. I mean, this is language from the Cold War. That they're bringing back up and they're saying the fairest democratic hemisphere whatsoever. And they want the, the, the exclusion of China and Russia of the hemisphere. This is real, you know, yeah. this is the, the real purpose of this. It's the a problem is, desire versus a multilateral. Well, not only, not only multilateral, but this is the imposition of the United States uh, uh, policies and, and interests over the national interests of our country. If it is to the national interest of Venezuela, or Colombia, Peru, whichever country you want in this region, to have a relationship with other countries, it, the United States can't be the one to determine who's you know who we have a relationship with, and we had a relationship, a strong relationship of cooperation with Russia, with China, with other countries, and and we are the ones, Venezuelans. Again, this is an issue of what the Venezuelan people need and what the Venezuelan people want and what the Venezuelan people vote for. I mean, what we we need to we decide who. Who is in our interest to have relations with? It can be imposed from, from outside. What the United States is doing is something very dangerous. It's telling the rest of the continent, you have no right to decide who you relate with. You can only relate to us in our terms. Otherwise, we are going to impose our 2.0 Monroe Doctrine. So and then this is very, it's, it's very uh, uh, dangerous uh, precedent. And it shows us this is an aggression, not only to Venezuelans. I mean, we... We're the ones speaking out. We're the ones resisting. But, there, but there's a, a group of countries that are going to suffer for this. I want to um, just share with our listeners something. I, I shared this with you before we went on the air yesterday. Um, I was um, taking a ride home. I was in a lift, and uh, the driver asked me about um, Code Pink Radio, which airs Thursdays at 11 a.m. on WPFW. I'm going to plug this for a moment, WBAI mm -hmm. um, Live. And I said, yes, we do a, a live mm -hmm. radio show every week, but we also do these um, webinars on Wednesday. And I said, and he wanted to talk a little bit about that. And I mentioned that, you know, we were having somebody on Wednesday from the Venezuelan Foreign Ministry um, talk to us from Caracas. And he said, and you'll be happy to know this, listeners, and Carlos too, that not everyone in the United States is fooled by the mainstream media. Thy driver's response was, you'll be hearing from the government the people recognize. Mm -hmm. And I said, the people of the, the government, the people of Venezuela recognize versus the government that the United States wants. And he said, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So there are people here in the United States who clearly understand the importance of national sovereignty and mm -hmm. that it is not the United States job to be imposing, you know, a hemispheric uh, mm -hmm. vision um, on other countries. So I just want people mm -hmm. to know that just there is some belief in national sovereignty, even here, no, no, no. Even here in we, Washington, D.C. <laughs> we know this, yeah. and that's why, and we have a relationship with the, you know, that's why we always made a, a, an important a point of, of maintaining our relationship with the people of the United States. I mean, we have, we have people in this administration 
which unfortunately we can't deal with. I mean, you have the uh, the National Security Council, you have Mauricio Claver Caron, who's uh, from a Cuban American origin and who's who has set, you know, as part of his personal agenda, vendetta against uh, Venezuela, against Cuba, against all progressive forces in, in, in Latin America. And this is the person that, that repeats what Trump said in his State of the Union, that, you know, that Venezuela had to be crushed and destroyed. And, you know, uh, and, and, you know, the, a few days ago, in, on, also on TV, he went in, in one of the, um, in CNN in Spanish to, to, to give an interview. And he said that, you know, this, the purpose was to destroy Venezuela's government. And, you know, the, the, these are the people in the administration that, that, you know, we obviously have issues with, but we, we have a, a wonderful relationship with the people of the United States, a relationship with solidarity. You know, we have a, a lot of people here uh, um, you know, coming uh, to to Venezuela to to talk to us and to engage with the Venezuelan people and to engage with you know what what really, what really uh, it's going on. Uh, so I think it's it's important uh, to keep in mind that this this hike, this new maximum pressure, you know, we are afraid because we know the history of this region. We know the history of you know paramilitary activities in Colombia. Um, and most, and some of them linked to to the current uh, Colombian government. Uh, we see also Brazil stamping up the pressure. Brazil recalled its uh, its uh, uh, diplomats uh, just a couple of days ago in order to you know, exert some more pressure on Venezuela. So we see that something may be developing where the participation of these uh, countries uh, can you know can be considerable and can be again dangerous to the stability and to the peace in the region. Uh, they talked to the, the, again, the, the high government official that we don't know his name or her name. Um, the person talked about uh, an alliance of those three countries in particular, an alliance of uh, Colombia, the United States, and Brazil against Venezuela, against Venezuela's government. So it's definitely something that we, uh, you know, that we are concerned. Um, I see Margaret well, I think was asking. It's a very, question. yeah, and I, I have one thing. Well, let's have Margaret ask her question, and I have a follow up question from something you talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. But I mean, just for our viewers to understand that Venezuela is now looking at a US uh, Brazil relationship, which is the eastern and southern border of Venezuela, and, mm -hmm. and then Colombia, the western border, and the southern command on the coast north coast of venezuela so mm -hmm. there's a real that's you see the you know how you're circled basically now surrounded yeah you know completely surrounded by u.s interests and uh foreign policy interests and now military interests mm -hmm. um one of the things you mentioned earlier and then margaret i'll get to your question um because it's it's in addition to the conversation you mentioned uh the sanctions being um, collective punishment on an entire population of people, which is uh, a human rights violation. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the foreign minister's visit to the International Criminal Court and um, presenting uh, the human rights violations to the world? So this is one of the issues that we uh, we decided to take up because we know that this is a, a violation of, of human rights. Like you said, it's, uh, it could also be considered a crime against humanity. So uh, there is the International Criminal Court that, see, that seeks to um, uh, stop or, or condemn people that have, been, that have perpetrated these uh, crimes against humanity. And we took a case where we are, uh, we're going to be presenting for you know, the next uh, couple of months uh, all the um, evidence that we have of how these uh, so-called sanctions are affecting everyday life for Venezuelans and how they have, you know, they have had a specifically damages or to, you know, to the health of Venezuelans, how they have damaged the economy in a way that is preventing Venezuelans to access uh, basic goods and how this has collectively been inflicted on all the population. Um, the, the Statute of Rome, which is what, what uh, creates the International Criminal Court, um, Venezuela is part of the statute, the United States is not. However, there is, there is some uh, uh, precedent, uh, jurisprudence uh, that states that if a country is affected, then it, then it, it does involve you know, uh, uh, the court. So 
what we're trying to, what we're hoping is that the court sees the case. It's already, it's already, it has already taken the case and it's proceeding into analyzing. And we hope that with the evidence that we present, there could be a, a, a statement uh, saying, um, a decision saying that the United States has indeed violated uh, Venezuelan, the rights of Venezuelan people and constituting this uh, as a crime against humanity. It is important because I think we must start once again, returning to multilateral institutions. We must start returning to diplomacy. The world cannot continue in this you know, constant aggression of you know, uh, one country against the other just because one country is, feels more powerful, has the weapons to do so. We need to start, uh, you know, uh, go back to civilization, basically. And, and it's important that, that international law is respected. And, you know, we're, we're doing this with the support of international law. We believe that we have a case. And in the past, you know, other, other courts have, have seen a, a issues that are similar. For example, in the, in the, cases, uh, the case of Argentina, there was uh, with the vulture funds, it was a, you know, a violation of Argentinian rights. In the case of Nicaragua, where there was, uh, they also won a, a lawsuit um, in another international court um, for the aggression the United States uh, had against them. So we're, we think that there is there's a true case here that will set a precedent for, for humanity to try to you know, act against these measures. Because again, these are illegal. These go against all the, all the spirit that we had when we created United Nations, when we you know, uh, tried to have a civilized relationship amongst nations. So we need, we need to go back to defending those principles, the UN Charter and international law and defense of peace. So let's go. Um, I think you saw that we have a question from one of our viewers, Margaret Flowers. Question is, can you talk about the new counter-terrorist unit and what Venezuela is doing to prepare for greater US aggression? Well, we're starting uh, things, uh, you know, measures to, to, um, to avoid uh, these, uh, new uh, actions uh part of the of, of this unit against terrorism is also you know to prevent this type of crimes you know some, some sort of what happened you know uh, uh not only attacks on on public institutions but also on the people because we we've seen i mean we had we had here a history in venezuela in not not so long ago uh how people were affected by the you know so-called protests the warimbas um that were you know supposed to be demonstrations for the opposition where you had, you know, snipers uh, shooting at people, you know, no, people often think, uh, because if you only read mainstream media and, and the report of the NGOs paid by the USID or National Government for the Democracy, you think that they're only, the only confrontation between protesters and government and officials or, or, or you know, police officials and, and that uh, the people, the only people that got hurt were protesters. But actually, you know, when you look at, you know, the, the, what took place in 2017, about a third of the people that actually lost their lives were law enforcement officers trying to contain uh, violent demonstrations. And they did so uh, at, with attacks uh, promoted by some of these more extremist groups in the opposition. So this is kind of the, I think uh, all, all these comes together, you know, the violence from outside, the violence that has entered uh, Venezuela, uh, you know, for a long period of time uh, in our border, uh, you know, so, uh, from the civil war conflict in, in Colombia. Um, so there's always so these issues that we're trying to address and to prevent so that we can make sure that the Venezuelan people can live in peace. And what we're trying to do to, you know, to circumvent the sanctions, I think, is to, you know, uh, hold a strong position for multilateral uh organizations and, and for multilateral law and for international law, you know, there's a group of countries that have already, you know, made a statement last year. Uh, they have made a statement again, uh, uh, you know, it's last year on February, then, then again uh, in the summer during the meeting of non-aligned movements. And they stated that, you know, they're against uh, unilateral measures. They're, they're in for defending the principle of, of the UN Charter. These countries are trying to seek uh, alternatives to you know, to promote at multilateral levels where we can for sure defend these principles and, and try to avoid uh, complying with these sanctions. Because one of the, you know, and our, our friends from uh, Iran uh, had a very interesting uh, perception 
uh, they, they discuss that there's also there, there's, a, there's a thing called passive unilateralism where you have countries that are not, you know, applying sanctions, but they take them. You know, they, they sort of, they comply with sanctions that the U.S. is promoting against a uh, third country. So this is something that we have to revise also in the international community. If we know that these sanctions are not legal because they didn't go to the, to the U.N. Security Council, you know, we have to also do an effort to not allow countries like the United States or the European Union or whoever is implementing these sanctions to get away with them because they, you know, we, we, we created a system of law in the United Nations that we must abide in. And I think uh, this principle is, you know, we, we have to fight unilateralism, we have to fight the coercive measure, but we also have to, have to fight its passive form we, where people just simply comply out of fear, companies comply out of fear. You know, we have to start giving uh, room for for people, for companies, for the in different international actors to be able to act against uh, unilateralism. I think, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think Michelle Bachelet said a, a day or two ago, she addressed um, what you're referring to with over compliance or institutions, mm -hmm. people are not directly sanctioned by the United States or other uh, entities, but um, she specifically uh, mentioned that the Venezuelan people are suffering the greatest because of overcompliance by international financial institutions. Right. And so what happens is that people, institutions are afraid of being um, fined by the United mm -hmm. States or afraid of you or losing trade with the United States. So mm -hmm. they just, uh, you know, decide not to uh, trade with Venezuela or any other um, sanctioned countries that they, and, and Iran specifically is seeing a loss with its, with uh, European businesses that are invested in those countries. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's, it's clearly a type of extortion. And you have banks that are not going to uh, accept the transactions, not on anything wrong, but because afraid that if they, if they do a money transfer, and you know, money transfer is simpler as, as you know, us paying the salaries of our uh, staff in our embassy. Yeah, if yeah. if we try to make, you know, this is this is an issue that we have dealt with, you know, making, and I dealt with this when I was in Washington as, and as part of the embassy, you know, we are, are, I couldn't pay some of our local employees or we had delays in the payment of our local employees because the banks wouldn't make the transaction. A simple transaction would take, you know, a couple of hours, a couple of days to, you know, just to come in. The banks don't want to do it because they're afraid that if they move any sort of amount of money for Venezuela, for the Venezuelan government, they could be accused of, you know, aiding terrorism or aiding narco traffic or whatever, you know, some of the, all these uh, accusations that they, that they make. And these institutions don't have the strength to face uh, the consequences that, you know, OFAC, Treasury are going to, uh, to put against them. So they decide that, you know, they they are going to be extra careful. They're going to take measures that are not, that are not anywhere. I mean, they're not written down anywhere, but they're taking this as a form of, you know, guaranteeing that they don't get in trouble. This is extortion. This is something that you know, you're really doing, you're doing extorting not only the, the banks, but, you, but you're making people suffer. And in some cases, I mean, when I was there, it was making U.S. citizens suffer. I mean, the local employees that we had, we had delays in paying them, you know, delays in, in getting their rent paid. And, 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 all, and you know what that means in the United States when you, you, you know, when, when you don't have a system that supports you and when, and when you need to, you know, to pay your rent. And, and you know, they, these, these people were taking this uh, 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 aggression from their own government just because they wanted to make a point uh, and, and, you know, and, and they were starting the banks to make a point and to somehow hurt the, the Venezuelan people, uh, the Venezuelan government. So, again, um, this is something that, that we need to fight against. I, I can um, just share with you and, and, and our viewers one thing specifically that, that I witnessed uh, when I was still living in the San Francisco Bay Area with the consulate there at the mm -hmm. time, and you were still in, in Washington, D.C., and the difficulty in getting your foreign, your foreign diplomats paid as well as their mm -hmm. local staff when the, the money was sitting in the bank in San Francisco, mm -hmm. And the bank, uh, I will say, I believe it was Bank of America, at, and um, and could not would not disperse the money mm -hmm. to the consulate account to pay the rent, 
to the mm -hmm. consulate's landlord or to pay for uh, the Venezuelan staff and the U.S. staff that was working in that. Right. So, so that's where, you know, it just ripples out to all uh, parts of society and everyone right. suffered, not just what the U.S. claims it's targeting. So, and, that's and I know it was an enormous... measures. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So we have um, a question. Oh, gosh, let me see. Okay, I have a question from Michelle Elmer here. Uh -huh. uh, she says, who just called the coronavirus a pandemic? What is Venezuela doing to control the situation? Do you have cases in Venezuela? How do the sanctions affect Venezuela's ability to respond? Well, we don't have any, currently, we, have, we don't have any cases in Venezuela. Uh, yesterday, uh, President Maduro was uh, doing a, uh, an interview again, uh, you know, not an interview, sorry, uh, a public event where he spoke about the, uh, the issue of coronavirus. We're taking all the possible measures that, that we can take, you know, the people being screened when, when they're coming into the country and, you know, ask the, how they're feeling. But I think, uh, above all things, uh, we're resorting to multilateralism again uh, because it's difficult for us, it has been difficult for us to get access to some, uh, to some uh, medicines throughout all these, you know, last couple of years. But we directly went to the World Health Organization precisely on the case of, um, of, and we already have gotten uh, medicine to deal with this and as well as the kits, the test kits, so that we can uh, test patients and make sure you know, uh, that, that we do the right tests and, and, and we can diagnose if they have or not. And meanwhile, we're preparing our, our, um, our hospitals so that they, they are able, once, so it, it seems likely that it, you know, at one point in time, uh, we might get hit with, with, with these cases. If, you know, apparently, it's something that is going to happen to every country around the world. Once that comes, uh, you know, we are in, in a prepared position. Let me tell you also, also something as well, that despite all the aggressions against our public health system, the fact that we do have a public health system, the, ha the fact that it has, you know, uh, that it also has uh, a large uh, distribution throughout the country because when the Barrio Adentro project, which was something that created with President Chavez in solidarity with the Cubans, you know, the Cuban doctors that came in and, and we created a network of, of, um, of the, 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 you know, primary care and prevention care uh, uh, throughout the inner city communities and the rural communities. Uh, you know, that helps something that the United States has not achieved yet. No, and well, and 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 doesn't seem that there's uh, well, there there is. I'm not going to get into internal U.S. issues, but there is some there is some candidates speaking about this and 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 some uh, disqualifying. But I think it is important, and you can see with the example in China, how uh, having a state uh, healthcare system uh, was very helpful to dealing with this crisis. And I think, you know, we, we want to rely on, on, our, on our system. We want to rely on, uh, on the, and, and I say this because the, the prevention is, is key. Right, the because it's not, only, it's not only the virus, but, you know, the, the making sure that the community has access, you know, uh, has access to the right information. The community takes the precautions, the necessary precautions not to express the disease, to, to understand what the disease is about, really, and not to, you know, freak out because of a, of a media campaign, or you know, the no, 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 not believe, uh, not believe rumors. That is a key element in preventing this crisis, and that is something that we have a big network for because we have a public health system. So I think I think it's key. Uh, um, so wonderful question, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, I think it's it's a it's a good point. Um, we we have we're trying to take care of this as best we can, and we're getting prepared uh, so that whenever. If this comes to Venezuela, we have uh, our people can have the confidence that we're dealing with. We we also count on the solidarity of China and Cuba, which we have already made uh, contact with regards to treatment, medicine, and and all other aspects of, of facing this. Well, I think it, it. I mean, it's an amazing comparison with the United States that you know you and your country are out in front of this versus still waiting to respond to it as I mean we're basically self-regulating here in the United States canceling our own events for fear of having large crowds cross-contaminating one another we're, we're pretty much regulating ourselves as individuals there doesn't seem to be 
any um, government leadership on this, and I do not blame that for this specific government. It's just how our healthcare system being privatized in this country is just not mm -hmm. capable of um, responding in the way that your system is. So no, no, for sure. I think this is this is an issue uh, uh, for the larger uh, the ideological debate on the you know the necessity of a strong state. And, and public and a strong public health system, um, you know, beyond the government that you have the, uh, at this moment is something about how we deal with uh, human problems, community problems on a large scale when you don't have a strong state system. You know, the neoliberal models has destroyed basically public health, public education, and these, this is the result. And when you have a crisis of this sort, you, have, you don't have the tools to deal with. So let me ask you, you know, I know um, I had committed you to 20 minutes and we're like well into almost an hour of conversation with you. And I'm so pleased, despite everything that you are dealing with right now that you've had time for us. Is It looks like we have one more. I've got another question here if you have time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is from Matthew Bridges. So we have people watching us on Zoom and we have um, a significantly large audience on Facebook Live as well. Uh, so Matthew's question is, can you speak more to how you see diplomacy as a solution to confronting US imperialism? What do these talks actually look like between non-Guaido opposition and other countries in the region? What are the main points of misinformation that have been spread about Venezuela in the international community? Okay, well, we, we probably need another hour for <laughs> to answer, <laughs> to answer everything. So all are part of that, I guess. It's yeah. Um, no, look, I think diplomacy is key, and and you know, as as sort of a foreign uh, foreign affairs uh, ministry, you know, we have to say diplomacy is is the way that nations, you know. Uh, have, civilized nations have to deal with their issues. Again, we're not saying that we're not going to have differences, but what we what we we are opposing is actions that you know hurt large populations. What the United States is doing, not uh, sitting down with us and having uh, you know a, a conversation on our differences, not working with our differences, is putting you know all of our country, all of our population at risk. Uh, you know, being hurt by the, the the effects of their of their measures, we believe that all the issues can be discussed. We are doing this with our internal office of this opposition. Again, there's large differences between us and you know uh, the people that, that have uh, backed President Maduro, for example, for all these years, and you know the people that are now uh, heading the National Assembly. There was an election on on uh, January fifth where Guaido did not get elected, but a new leadership uh, was elected in the National Assembly, which we have, we don't share any ideological uh, uh, stance with. These are, again, right-wing conservative, conservative Venezuelans. But the one, the one issue where we do, uh, um, I think we, we do understand each other, is in the sense that they don't want to see our country invaded. They don't want to see uh, a military action. They don't want to see violence. They want to find a way of resort, you know, resorting the political dialogue, the dynamics, and, and, and doing that. We need to comply with our constitution. We have elections that are being called for on, on this year, and we have to have those elections, and we need to sit down with our, you know, the, our opposition and figure out, you know, the new authorities to conduct those elections and to, and, and you know, and, and again, see what the result. You see, the thing is, Venezuela has, has never been afraid, at least this revolution has never been afraid of elections. This has actually been what supported this, this political process since the beginning. This is what I actually got look, even myself, I mean, this is what I got us excited about this process with precisely having elections. I miss having elections. I miss having elections every year, you know, because then, you know, the periods start coming in and now they're distanced to some a little more. But, you know, we, we had over 25 elections in less than, than 20 years. And I think it's important that, that we, you know, we understand that. Venezuelan and, and, and the Venezuelan leadership is not afraid of elections. The only ones that are really blocking elections are the United States and Trump's allies here in, in Venezuela, who are the ones blocking the, the new uh, Electoral Council, you know, blocking the opportunity of having uh, these elections take place. And you, have, and you have to ask yourself why. 
Is it because they re- is it because they know at the end of the day that they can't get elected that they, they don't mobilize people out in the streets and that's and that's why they want to they want to force change the government Libya where where a government was imposed uh, 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 after uh, you know uh, against President Evo Morales and now the person that's supposed to be the president. Uh, you know the interim president. It's the same plan, same, same. Yeah. Because they do this, they all do this by yeah, the text. It's the same template, same it's plan, the same it's, game plan. It, it's a template, you know. It's like, uh, yeah. yeah. So they they just change the names, and there's Guaido. They took Guaido out and they put Agnes, and it's the same yeah. thing. And but basically, basically, this this person is is a from a political party that I think only had like about three members in the whole National Assembly in 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 Bolivia. And now it's deciding the destiny, so it's, 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 it's forming policy uh, that is going to affect Bolivia for many years to come without being elected for that position. So, you know, so the, and they do this because that's the only way they can do it. And the United States has no problem whatsoever with that, but it does have a problem when we call for elections and when we want to, you know, to exercise uh, uh, our right with millions of people out in the streets voting. So I think it's important, again, we have, you know, we, we need to have more debates, of course. We want to have the debates, and we're having the debates with the opposition that, that believes in an independent Venezuela, in a country that needs to forge its own way out. I mean, the idea, what, we, what, we ask, what we've asked for the United States all this time is not even to support the Bolivarian Revolution, but to let us be, let us just make our own decisions. We have the right to make them right or wrong, left or right. That's our that's our issue. But what we need to do is, you know, what they what they need to do is to stay away and respect what the sovereign decisions from the Venezuelan people are. And and I think I think this is achievable. I think I, and I say, again, we're almost we're almost done with the process with a large part of the opposition. We're almost done with the process of of uh, finding a, a, a new electoral council. You had some very interesting messages, Jesse, from some of the political parties that were more, you know, uh, linked to Guaido and, and somehow uh, not wanting to to uh, to go to elections. Where now they're trying to say, well, we have to address this issue of elections this year. So because everybody understands that the, the only solution to Venezuela's problem is through politics. We don't want to have a civil war. We don't have to have confrontations on the street. Nobody wants that. The people. There are a lot of people in the opposition here. That is a fact, but the people in the opposition don't go out of the streets and follow white law in, in, in the numbers that they could because they know that it's a trick. Because they know that what the, that's trying to do is trying to uh, have a, a show, a, you know, a, a TV image where you have people fighting each streets and then just and then justify some more. And people don't want violence in Venezuela. I think people are very. Uh, people understand that the way to move forward is working on our problems, voting, you know, uh, electing our, our, our officials for, for the new electoral councils that we can vote. We can have a, a new national assembly that looks more, reflects more the country that we have today and the political positions that we have today. And then we move forward from there. Well, I, you know, I, I would share with we, with you and, and with our viewers that so important to understand, at least my perspective from being on the ground in your country, one, how resilient the Venezuelan people are. Of all political uh, affiliations with maybe except, you know, the very far right that's affiliated with the United States, but the resiliency of the people. And I would also argue that this intensified U.S. aggression is creating a greater sense of national pride and sovereignty within Venezuela, that people are, be, are seeing themselves as Venezuelans first and political parties second. And in other words, they're, you know, they want the, the, the sovereignty of the nation um, respected. And it's very, you know, it's a, it's, you can feel it when you're on the streets, you can feel it um, in Caracas and outside of Caracas. And it's not that uh, there are not some significant difficulties because of, of the sanctions imposed on the country, but people are working around them and are very much and very proudly Venezuelans. And it's a, it's a very powerful thing to be around. And that is something that the 
US in general just does not understand. I mean, if our government understands it, they don't want to believe it. And mainstream media certainly doesn't explain that uh, that sentiment to the American people as a, as a whole. It's, but it's very powerful. I would also, um, since we have um, Elaine here from Alliance for Global Justice, I think she's listening as well. I just want to um, mention that for those of you watching, I would really, really encourage you to go to Venezuela and and visit and uh, and come to a better understanding as to who the Venezuelan people are and what they are have achieved over the last 20 years and what they are still um, working towards. Um, Alliance for Global Justice has a delegation mm -hmm. uh, going to Venezuela. I believe the departure date is April 12. And you can find more information about that delegation at AF gj.org alliance for global justice uh if that's i would really encourage um those of you who have never been or haven't been for a while to go and uh and experience the country for yourself it's it's fantastic <laughs> as i continue to go back year after year and so i would encourage all of you to do that well they're really welcome uh, uh alliance for global justice where we're um we're working on a lot of things too. Uh, you know, hopefully to, uh, to move forward with with them. Uh, it's a it's a group that has uh, shown, uh, like Opink and like others, um, a strong solidarity with Venezuela, and and we want to uh, to know our our deep gratitude towards that, and we hope that we continue to to work on a lot of uh, uh, things together. Again, this uh, people to people uh, diplomacy, which is which is so important, so key to really strengthening uh, the relationship between our two countries. So maybe we should close with that, people to people and continuing, um, you know, grassroots diplomacy and sharing each other's stories on, in both countries. Is there anything, uh, you know, we've been talking for an hour, I can keep talking to you all afternoon. It's like wonderful mm. to, have, <laughs> to have your time. Is there anything else we should talk about before I let you go? Anything? That no, I, I would just say, no, I, I would just ask people to, uh, you know, listen, first of all, thank them for, you know, for their patience and, and for their, um, their continuous um, concern about Venezuela. I think it is, uh, it is very important for us to, to have that uh, constant communication and, and, uh, and, and we really appreciate that, again, that, that they are out there uh, trying to, uh, you know, to uh, to support us and 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 and, and you know uh, there have been large displays of solidarity uh towards venezuela and you know i can we can never thank you enough for all that you've done i mean not only not only you know like uh the delegations the presence the you know the the, the actions that when people take to the streets uh, you know the actions like the one coping just did yesterday i mean all these shows of displays of of solidarity are very important for us and and, and they stimulate us to, to continue and, the, and and the people on the streets now i'm not i'm not, I'm not going to speak just as, as, a, as an official but i'm saying the people on the streets you know uh have a, a lot of love for uh the u.s people and 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 the activists and the people that go out and, and defend the right of venezuela to, to they make its own choices i mean we have the uh, even the embassy protection collective which uh, uh also have, took that very courageous um, uh, action uh, to call people's attention on on, on the uh, on the issue of international law and how international law should be respected. All those displays of solidarity are very highly appreciated by the Venezuelan people as a whole, and we thank them. Uh, we can never thank them enough for that. And we need, we want you to know as well that we know of your struggles in the United States. I mean, there's a lot of things that that you deal with. And you need to know that you have, you know, the Bolivarian government, the Bolivarian revolution, and, and the people of Venezuela also in solidarity with all those uh, just causes. Um, you know, again, what, what we always uh, believe that, that this relationship between the U.S. and Venezuela should be about is, uh, is you know, to, to exclude all these aggressions, you know, to say no to intervention, to military intervention, to say no to, this, to these sanctions. And to just say, you know, let the Venezuelan people choose their own destiny. That's all we know. That's all we need. That's all we want. That's, that's the respect we expect from from the people of the United States, from the government of the United States. We know we have it from the people. We expect that from the government as well. 
Well, we'll keep doing the best on our end. As, as you know, a good percentage of U.S. citizens do not approve of U.S. foreign policy, and, uh, and uh, it's really important for uh, U.S. citizens to educate, you know, with, among ourselves as to what's going on inside and outside of the country. And um, that's the best action that we can take, trying to influence what our own government does with our taxpayer dollars. So, and let other nations um, respect, you know, other countries' national sovereignty. So, yeah, don't well, let Guaido steal your money. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a couple articles out about that. What what's happened with that USAID money? You can see that at CodePink.org. If um, for for viewers who are interested in reading more. So um, I'm going to let you go because I know you've got a, a, lot, Thank you. a lot to do. <laughs> we thank you so much for an hour of your time and we look forward to talking with you again. Thank you very much. Okay. Anytime. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.